So I'm just going to start the conversation. Like I said, um, I, I watched the documentary and um, I really enjoyed the fact that it was sort of uh, really two women's views of their country and sort of sorting out where India and Pakistan were. So for people who haven't watched the documentary, uh, it's basically uh, Sabiha and Kalki uh, both together visit the, each other's countries, India and Pakistan, and they're trying to understand what is happening to their country, respective countries. Um, specifically the movement towards an, a religious identity, a Hindu identity in uh, India and a more kind of uh, uh, Islamic identity in Pakistan, right? Uh, and whether in, even though they seem to have had very disparate paths uh, over the last 70 years since independence, whether they've ended up in the same place uh, in many ways and they're grappling with the same kind of issues. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of questions about the documentary. You should feel free to ask whatever questions you want. So I'm going to ask about um, what interested me was this moment of disagreement between you and Kalki, right? When Kalki says, it's not that I have faith in the government, I have faith in the people, right? Uh, that she doesn't think India is moving in the same direction. And actually, I'm going to start with Kalki, and I'm going to ask whether it's because you grew up in the South. Because I did notice that the documentary is very much in, I, where, Sabiha, where did you get permission? Your visa was for Bombay? Um, yes, Bombay, Delhi, um, some surrounding area. We went where we could go. You know? Right, right, because that is yeah. the limitation, right? The Indian government is very strict. Um, so I wanted to uh, get a sense of whether um, Kalki's view of what it means to be Indian, given that she lives in Bombay and works in Bombay, but she grew up in the South, uh, is a little different uh, than, say, if she had been, you know, born and brought up in UP, or does it come from there or does it come from a different place? And then I want to like, you know, then move to you Sabiha and see like what you saw in terms of how you saw Indians defining themselves. But I thought we'd start with Kalki because, you know, I, I'm in the South and half, a, half of us are in the South. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, the, the fact that I am from the South that I, have been to so many different parts, which are so, so different uh, in different parts of India, you know, made me feel like there is a lot of diversity in, in this country. Um, having said that, you know, I look at, I look at the documentary, uh, how many ever years now down the line, and I feel quite optimistic and naive uh, looking at it. Because I do, you know, we, we have been going into um, uh, kind of a more fundamental point of views uh, and, and a religious identity, which is overtaking um, people's individuality and also people's freedom. So uh, I don't think I've lost hope, uh, but I do see what Sabio was talking about. Right. And, and so, uh, Sabiha, so did you think that when, when you came to India and you were in Bombay, Maharashtra, Delhi, um, what did you find, those are very different parts of the country, like what did you find was a common thread despite this diversity? What was this undercurrent that you thought brought it together that you could sense and that you think that the documentary revealed? Um, well, actually, you know, I've had, I've lived in India for several years also, uh, and I've traveled to India frequently even before that, uh, because my parents are both from Bombay. Uh, so it was always like second home, but uh, my husband is a Tamilian. Oh, really? And um, he's from Sri Lanka, though. Yeah. So uh, we've been to Chennai and uh, Bangalore and... Uh, you know, um, but always, of course, 
you know, fighting for visas, trying to get addresses of friends and family and so on. So that has always been a struggle. But I have traveled, I wouldn't say widely, but I have been able to see at least some different part of India. And I really don't think they, are co they have anything in common. You know, I think every part of India is so distinct and so um, its cuisine, its language, its, uh, its practice of religion, um, so many rituals and, um, and, and it's a bit similar in Pakistan too, the Punjab and Sindh and the Saraiki area and the Pakhtun and the Balochia, really distinct um, cultures and nations in themselves you know so i think that uh, this is what i was trying to say in the film and sorry to divert your question into mm -hmm. a longer answer but what i was trying to say is that there are such diverse nations that have been put together under the umbrella of what is called india that if you i think uh, nehru was very clever in putting together a secular ideology that everybody had to follow it's like the american dream right you know? right everybody's following that and you break that up i don't i mean it's very worrying where it will go although i must get back to um kalki's question uh, or kalki's observation that the people will fight uh, there is truth in that kalki people will fight and have to fight we have no other option so um, you're not at all naive in thinking that. That's our hope here, and that's your hope there, and that's the hope everywhere in the world. India is, of course, a very large country, so it will take some time for that people's movement that we all dream of, that we all live for, for to come together. But it will, it must. I'm curious whether in Pakistan, whether you have those kind of very stark differences in how much that you know i i the tea bag thing where you'd say like you know extremism is like you know a tea bag it seeps out into the bloodstream of a country right um i wonder if you see the same difference so, so in india it's it's not fair to say that it is the same in bengal as it is in up so it has you know the tea bags are bigger in up and the seeping is much more extreme uh, in kerala not so much uh, maharashtra a little more right so it depends where you are in the country so i wonder if that is you know i'm curious about how that plays out in pakistan because just because so many of us are, don't really under we see pakistan as a kind of uniform homogenous blob right uh, it's a country so i wonder if you see that kind of regional disparities um or disparities in terms of communities or parts of pakistan where you know maybe fundamentalism is stronger and parts where it isn't yeah uh, i mean that's definitely the case and um, in pakistan too that you will see that in the more tribal areas it, it's more rigid. Islam is far more rigid and it's rigidly practiced as well. Whereas um, Karachi City, which has been more cosmopolitan in the past, before the Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism started to gain currency here, you did have a lot of Christians and Parsis and even some Hindus and you know different kinds of people, right. well, Chinese, there was a lot of Chinese community here. Um, so a lot of different people, similar to Bombay, smaller, but similar to Bombay in its vibe, you know, um, and a very nice coastal city with lots of different cuisine as well. So, uh, you know, religiosity took some time to catch up here when mm -hmm. uh, it was already the way people practiced in the more tribal areas. And Balochis have a different, a different culture altogether. Uh, Punjab has been quite religious also. Um, but over the years, because it's been now about 40, more than 40 years mm. that 
it looks like the country has turned more and more as a whole, more and more obscurantist. Mm. And this is what is a bit scary mm. because it is like, like Arun, in Arundhati's words, tea seeping out of a tea bag, you know, it will, it will go, whether it goes slowly or fast, or if, you know, if it takes its time, but it's happening. And that's, that's really worrying. Because there comes a time where, you know, a generation of people younger than me sure. are not, you know, they haven't witnessed the Pakistan I know. They don't know the country I knew that mm -hmm. I grew up in. They have no knowledge or experience of it. So they cannot even be created. They will create something better maybe. And, you know, but the one I knew is gone. And so what, and, and what about you, Kalki? So you visited Pakistan. Was this your first time there? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. And, and what was your observation about a Pakistani identity? I, I, I noticed you went to, you know, sort of more rural areas. You also were in Karachi for that fashion shoot. You saw a different, you know, at least some parts, different parts of Pakistan. And mm -hmm. what was your sense about that Pakistani identity and that diversity? And, uh, you know, whether you saw the same, what, it was your first encounter. I just want to know about that encounter, I guess. Yeah, I remember packing like uh, very conservative clothes, mm. thinking I'm going to Pakistan and I should be well covered up. Mm. Um, but found myself quite as much, I mean, the male gaze in India is not easy. And similarly in Pakistan, it's not easy, but they were very accepting of, you know, me wearing my t-shirts or whatever it is. Mm. Um, so I guess, in a lot of senses, there's there's a there's this very similar patriarchal um, weight that lies there, but there's also, um, especially in a place like Karachi, it's so echoing of Bombay. You know, uh, there's also mm. space for dialogue, even though you're speaking to people, at, as you said in this fashion show, where these guys were like, oh yeah, if our women did this, our elders would, you know, uh, kill them. And that's a really shocking yeah. news to receive as a film actor who spends her time in, uh, in front of the camera. But there was also this sense of, um, you know, this is something that we live under, but we don't, you know, they, they were still having chai with us, sitting with us, very happy to interact with us. You know, there was a sense of um, civil contact with each other. Um, I didn't at any point feel uh, threatened or, you know, oh my God, my security is, you know, I mean, we didn't have any security. It was just me and Sabya and the camera people, that's it. So, you know, in that sense, I was, you know, I was surprised. I, I you know, my experience showed me that people are very, very approachable. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, they are living under a certain fear. And I saw that, I, I remember with that little girl um, that we spoke to and we asked her, what, what did she want to be? This was in a rural area. And, and she said she wanted to be um, like a religious teacher, okay. someone who learns the Quran, right? All yeah. 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 And, and after the cameras were not on her, we started chatting about Bollywood movies and you know how much she loves movies. And you know, she was happy to talk about how she would love to be in movies. So it's it's also this duality where you live a certain exterior because you know there is that there is that fear. And then there's there's people with their dreams and, and their hopes and you know what they want, what they want. So I have one question kind of like jumping off that. So um 
I honestly haven't been to Pakistan except I think I I was in the states and I took a PEI plane thinking I could stay with my friends in Karachi and realize that the governments don't approve of any such thing um but uh I was struck by the fact that um maybe it was in the documentary the absence of female bodies in public um even on the pavement amongst the poor women and the bais even those women who live on the pavement indian women are outside um was it just because of the locations that i didn't see a lot of female bodies in public or i just and i wonder how how that affects um or doesn't affect for example um this move towards religiosity because um one of the interesting things in india is that women have been voting in higher and higher and higher numbers but bjp is winning also so it's not actually as the all that feminist voting you know women coming out and you know embracing their right to vote has particularly changed that trajectory in places like up or bihar right um so i wonder like so the participation of women in public spaces women being seen being part of the discourse um first of all is it because i'm watching a documentary that i'm not seeing women out there in public uh being part of uh society like working like you know um indian women do of all classes uh and are in public or and do you think sabiha that would change something that would if we were to because there's a very poignant moment when they sort of tell you to leave the village because and i uh, i was just so proud of you where you actually fought back and you said but she wants to talk to me right um she wants to talk to me you're the ones who are not allowing her to talk to me so there's this young woman that sabiha tries to talk to at a village and the men will not allow her to speak so i wonder if that you think would more gender equality more gen you know equal gen women participation would change that trajectory yeah first of all i'd say that um, you know we went everywhere we were in the cities we were in the villages we were also in islamabad and punjab you know we were in sind we we went to we traveled quite a bit um and um it is true that women no, no. have sort of vanished from the public space sorry no no, no, no. i mean it's someone somebody... yes okay um so women have vanished from the public space over the years um just as you know walls have gone up and the dress code has changed um and if you do find women outside working class women they'll be covered from head to toe right you know? so that has become the norm in this country now over the years this change has taken place and we witnessed witnessed that happening um whether uh, having more equality change things yes absolutely it will you know? and pakistan was equal more tolerant more open society a more progressive society i think it was doing quite well for itself it was a new country that it was um, i think i do in a very a society that was come from its own skin um and uh, but now what has happened is kalki i pointed out we feel one thing and say one another thing so it's this duplicity you know that one is having practice on a daily basis that puts a lot of stress on people and puts the kind of stress that makes the whole society very unhappy mm.
you guys saw Sabia is, is it Sabia's internet that's also not very good because I'm yeah, I, I'm not, not hearing it well. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was is my internet good? Yeah, it seems to be breaking. Okay. Hang on, let me, okay, let me let me let me do something else. Maybe we'll get uh, I'm still Is this better? Yes. Uh, yes. Is this better? Yeah. I mean, it okay. comes and goes. Yeah. I think when you have a long, uh, you know, this, this is be better because it's. Um, I'm, I mean, I have an external device now on, and uh, it should work. Yeah. Yeah. I yes. can hear you better now. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you to repeat that last bit, which I think I lost completely? The duality about the duality, no? Yes. Thank you, Kalki, because I was wondering what my last bit was. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so I said that it's true what Kalki pointed out, what she felt on the ground there, that uh, people say one thing and believe in another thing. Hmm. And they constantly have to juggle this duality, which makes them very stressed out and very unhappy. So largely, I think, Pakistani society is stressed under the burden of a duplicity that is so hard to maintain mm. and causes a lot of unhappiness all around. Right, the pressure to sort of maintain your in, inner self and your outer self and that yes. contradiction between the two. Do you think that that exists also in India though? I mean, uh, that we have those kind of what we feel inside, because we do have, you know, very patriarchal parts of this country. And, you know, it's not as though we are lacking in the patriarchy department. Um, what do you think, Kalki? I think to a certain degree, of course. I mean, I still see it in, in very, in more conservative families where, you know, the, the parents are very conservative, but the, the kids are not, and then they hide stuff from their own parents and all of that. Um, no, and, and of course, it, 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 there are places where it, it exists, but I think that in, in a city like Bombay, um, I don't see it as strongly as I saw it in Karachi. Uh, I still feel that people have some sort of, you know, kind of more, a, a, a more I guess, don't democratic, um, right or they feel they have it i don't know it's changing now as we speak it's changing um no, but women being out is actually not changing that is the one thing the bjp government has not slapped down on they do, they're very happy to say beti padao they're very happy to give lpg they've got all the women votes doing all that shit right i mean yes. the, the bjp that's the one thing that the bjp is not regressive on which is women working women being educated um, there is no rhetoric from the BJP government even once to say that women should not be educated or work. It comes from very sort of traditional caste structures, but it's not in the political discourse. There is no political discourse around keeping women at home. Um, mm. But there is... It just lacks intersection sectionality. Yes. Is that the right yes. Word? Yeah. So there is no conversation between, you know, what it means to be a Dalit woman as opposed to being a Brahmin woman, uh, what it means to be a Muslim woman as opposed to being a Christian woman. Uh, so it's all very well to, you'll say, Beti Padhao, but now you're telling Muslim girls in uh, Karnataka saying, you can't wear a hijab and go to college. Now give up your hijab, only then you can get an education, right? So it, 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 it's, uh, it's not that Muslim women can't, be educated. It's like you have to choose your identity if you want an education, which is a different kind of discourse. Um, well, it's oppression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's 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 a it's a kind of like, but it's not like sit at home and have babies, right? Um, no, that yeah. is, and in fact, if anything, it becomes a different kind of oppression, saying that the Muslim men don't allow Muslim women to go out, and then becomes a, another club to communities on the head with, right? But uh, yeah. in that sense. But 
Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead and finish because I wanted to add so, something. So, no, no, so I was, I was asking you the question was, can you see a very kind of um, uh, a feminist kind of religious fundamentalist uh, ideology that might be very behind women, you know, being educated, being out in the public sphere, you know, being uh, political leaders, but, you know, very much about oppressing minorities, very much about, you know, uh, squelching freedom of, you know, choice, a sort of Chinese model in some ways. Well, I don't know about the Chinese model, but uh, can you hear me? For one thing, even the men are not saying that women should just sit at home and have babies because they need the women workforce. They need it in the rural areas. They need it mm. in uh, the urban areas, but they just say that you have to be covered. There has to be segregation. You can work. You should work. We need the money. We need your labor, you know, um, but, uh, but you're not, to f not free to dress as you wish because you don't know what's good for you. We don't know what's good for you. So, um, uh, check my internet. Right. So, in that sense, um, it's a kind of it's a, it's it, the control is in the hands of men, and they will tell you what is to be done and what is not to be done, right? How you should dress and how you should look at and who you should sit with and who you should not. So there's education sure. for women. Uh, there are schools, there's segregation, universities, women go to universities. Um, I mean, of course, the government doesn't stress and doesn't prioritize education. That's another matter. But they don't really prioritize education for anyone. You know, that's just not their priority. But uh, it's not as if right. uh, there's 100% literacy amongst boys, men, but zero amongst women. It's not like that, you know? Uh, there are fewer number of women um, in all professions, medical, engineering, uh, whatever, uh, even in, well, maybe not in the media. Media is maybe a more, hmm. more, more, more or less equal position, I would say. Um, but other than that, um, but your question was, if a fundamentalist movement, Islamic fundamentalist movement is led by women, which is a very scary thought. Uh, no, no. I like very much, you know, like communism kind of gave equality to women, was quite liberal in many ways when it came to gender equality, but it was extremely autocratic and repressive, right? Um, whether we can, we can imagine a religious kind of counterpart to that. Yes. Or is religion but, inherently... But, um, I mean, there are almost... I mean, there are some Islamic teachers who talk about feminism within the purview of Islam. And there is a very well-known lady called Farah Hashmi who advocates women's rights within Islam. Um, but I don't know where that is taking us because finally a woman's position is not equal to that of a man. Um, take any religion in the world, you know, it's not just Islam. And I don't even think Islam discriminates as in, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think the Quran itself discriminates against women. I think it has a lot to do with the customs and the people who follow that religion and what kind of power it brings to them. That's where it really, where the crux of the matter lies. So I think we have to shift the debate to uh, take it away. And when we talk about equality, when we talk about democracy, when we talk about freedom of speech, we have to take the debate away and okay. out of the framework of any religion Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and, and take it into a sphere where it is internationally acknowledged and respected that women and men are equal human beings. I think that's, that's where we want to head, right? I 
Okay, so I'm going to you know, open up to like uh, uh, audience questions. We want to start with Rahil. Rahil, you have a lot of questions. Could you just stick for with one per person, like one for Kalki, one for Sabiha, so that everyone else can get a chance? Sure. Um, thank you for organizing Rahil. this. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, your craft, both of you. And I still remember when, um, you know, Kalki was visiting Pakistan, there was like, you know, um, uh, these social media posts coming in that, you know, uh, Kalki is spotted at Karachi airport. Um, I, I was very excited that this uh, project uh, was, uh, you know, being organized or conceptualized. And like, I, I haven't seen the documentary till now, but I would, um, uh, I've just subscribed to the event skip and I would uh, watch it. My question is, uh, when you were visiting Pakistan, was there something um, that caught you by surprise? Like you were not expecting it, but um, it was something uh, that that really, uh, you know, made you interested in the culture or something like that. And uh, for um, Sabiha, um, I've seen uh, uh, a dinner with president and I think it was a very uh, nice narrative. I, I was really moved by the, the ending of it when you're uh, just talking to a person at, in the street and he just says that, you know, um, all the sustenance is given by God. So by like, what would the politics do? It was something like that. It's, it was very esoteric um, choice, I think. So how did you arrive to that process? Why did you end uh, such a, you know, politically driven uh, narrative to, to a very common man, uh, you know, narrative? So these are two questions. Thank you. I, yeah, so maybe you can start with Sabiha and then re repeat your question for Kalki. Um, so um, I think, you know, a Dinner with the President is largely a political um, film because it's really talking about democracy and what democracy means for Pakistan and to Pakistanis. Because my, uh, my, 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 when I, when I began working on, on this storyline, I was really thinking of, you know, who understands the concept of democracy because it's a concept of individual rights, right? Which comes to us from the French Revolution, really. So how many people understand that? Because in my previous observations in Pakistan, when I'm at a village and it's election day, a truck comes, women and children are hot, you know, put into that truck and then they go and they are told, hey, you know, you put your thumb on this cycle or on this arrow or on this rose or on this tiger or whatever. Yeah, you know? I'm also from Pakistan, by the way. Sorry, I'm cutting you short. So we have all experienced right. it. <laughs> right, right. So then, you know, that, that is the way. So what is the meaning of democracy was the idea. So it is a political narrative. And then you put into that, uh, you know, here we are talking about elections and democracy and individual rights, which is a very French European concept comes out of a certain kind of society. And that has been through industrialization, that has been through certain processes. And Pakistan is entirely more or less a feudal country. So I was trying to understand then the place of religion and the confusion between religion and democracy and, you know, trying to drive the narrative in that direction. But of course, it's quite open ended because it's a, demo, it's a, it's a documentary and one can't conclude, you know, those kinds of things in a documentary. Yeah. And Rahil, what is your question for, uh, for Kalki? Yeah, something that uh, caught her by surprise in Pakistan that she was not expecting. Uh, I actually don't know if anything caught me by surprise. I think I, I had heard so much about the hospitality in Pakistan and I received that hospitality with Sabia and with everywhere we went, you know, I mean, there was always a spread, there was always chai, there was always some food. That was something we kept talking about that India and Pakistan were 
constantly being fed or given something uh, to eat. And I, I, I think, I think when I watched the documentary, I, I you know, I felt, um, I felt a lot of, I felt a lot of stress for Sabia and for some of the places she went went without me. Um, and as a woman, uh, you know, you know, talking about the kind of things she was talking about and challenging the the patriarchy, um, that I guess not surprised me, but but you know it gave me a shock. It gave me a kind of like, oh my God, things really are tough and really tough um, uh, for a woman who wants to speak out. Um, and it's a, it's a long fight. So there's that. Thank you. Okay, we want to go on to Joy. Joy, you wanna ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's so lovely to have, I mean, such stellar women uh, I mean, and have the opportunity to have this AMA. So thank you for that. Uh, Sabia, my question is for you. And this is a huge regret of mine that on an Indian passport, unfortunately, it's next to impossible for me to travel to Pakistan. So my question goes back to, so this is in 2013 when I was in the US for grad school and this was the and I interacted with Pakistani people for the first time so my first time interacting with them and that itself was such a revelation that how similar we are in terms of people um, so anyways I'm digressing so this like this friend of mine and he of course so he's my age so right he would have been in his early 20s then in his early 30s now so he mentioned to me and I just want to hear your thoughts on it that how and he comes from a privileged and title family. So he had moved to Pakistan for college and then stayed on for grad school and much of his extended family did as well. And India, of course, was vastly different then than it is now. So what he said was that a lot of his friends and contemporaries had gotten quote unquote radicalized because there was just so much economic turmoil, political turmoil. So in a sense, it was just something that religious radicalization was just something to sort of hold on to so that was like his take on it so uh, same like so the way things had gone down in Pakistan so I just want to hear your views on it and also that if you see any parallels in India and how things have uh, progressed in the last couple of decades or so thank you thank you um, for the question I think it's very it's very pertinent because and, and like you said, it's happening in India too, that we are being asked to make a choice, you know, and asked to choose between, if we are Hindu, then why are we not saying that we are Hindu and why are we not making that our identity? Or if we are Muslim, why are we not saying we are Muslim and making Islam our identity? So it begins with that. So are you going to say, no, I'm not a Hindu. Okay, then what, what are you? And what are your parents? And that whole kind of invasion into your identity and a psychological game starts in which the process is to break you down. And this is happening very systematically in both our countries. It's been going on longer in Pakistan, but it's certainly happening in India too. You're, you're, you have to, you can't say, you know, I'm a person and... Uh, I, I just like to do what I do. I'm a filmmaker. I make films about subjects that touch me and I live here, but I also like to travel and you can't do that. So who you are is, you know, and your loyalty then to the state is being judged by what religion you are identifying yourself with. And you're not with us if you're so and so and you're not with us if you're so and so. So this whole majority concept, you know, which uh, Kalki and I were talking about while making the film, is a very dangerous concept in our countries that haven't had the historical process that lead to democracy. You know, where consensus is very, very important. Majority doesn't mean you come and put people against the wall and tell them to make a choice. Otherwise, you know, we are bigger, bigger. We have more muscle power. So 
I think when this young man talked about radicalization, I can totally understand that because a lot of us uh, go through this, you know, where we are being pushed to take a position. And you then don't have an identity, you won't get a job, you won't have friends. And tomorrow you run out of water, your neighbor won't want to talk to you and help you out. If there's a flood, nobody's there to get you. You are identified as some other, which is happening in India, right? I mean, India being a very large country with many minorities, with very large minorities, this is happening even more blatantly over there. You know, like Kalki and I were talking about the vegetarian building and the you know, I don't know, different um, uh, different identification of who can live where and do what. So, yeah, I hope that yes, yes, your that's, question. that's very helpful. Thank you. So jumping off that, Kalki, I wonder then if um, one of the things that works against that is... Um, caste in Hinduism because it is a little difficult, especially, you know, the BJP has kind of cultivated the Dalit vote and tried to create that homogenous identity, but caste is so ingrained, like it's a terrible, horrible thing, but does, is it also one of the reasons it's much harder to sort of say, here is this one Hindu identity? Because even the upper caste don't want to be clubbed with the lower caste in some ways. Uh, yeah, I think that um, what is being Hin what is Hindu is also a big question uh, because it was kind of, I mean, you know, there are all sorts of theories about it, it coming as a word to, to bring people together, but it wasn't really one religion. It was so many different uh, uh, belief systems and uh, and it is, yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Dalit movement and the Ambedka movement and the fact that there's Buddhism involved, I mean, it, it opens scope for a, a, a lot more diversity again. So absolutely, I think that that's another um, layer uh, of, of differences that we have. And, and yeah, and it's impossible to kind of put people into, into a, you know, one group. But I anyway think that whatever it is, that identity, whether it's, um, you know, the, you can't put one identity on a people. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we have, especially in today's world, influences from outside, from everywhere. We're so connected um, with the internet, we have access to, to ev so many things that we didn't have before that it's, it's really, really quite, quite ambitious and difficult to, to do that, to, to make people say that you have to be this. And the, and the, way, to, the way it's being done is through fear, um, through you know, state-driven fear. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how how it works. It is working, obviously, but it's also like it, there will always be dissatisfaction in the people as long as this continues. This kind of um, trying to make somebody one thing, you know. Right. And so here, even in the conversations you had, uh, there were very poignant conversations about what it means to be a Muslim. I think there's a real conversation of what is a good Muslim? You know, even if you embrace the Muslim identity, there is no agreement on what makes you a Muslim, right? A good Muslim. Yeah, I mean, there is such a huge divide, uh, you know, because within Islam, there are different fiqhs, there are different sects. Mm. And no one sect can agree with the other. And, um, you know, the biggest divide is between the Shia, Shias and the Sunnis. And then um, it's very complicated. And, um, but again, it comes down to power. Whoever has the power will then say, you know, my interpretation is right, which is why it is um, so dangerous to have religion uh, mixed up with politics because then it's that power that is actually instilling the fear, using religion, weaponizing religion, 
mm. and creating um, a, a society full of fear, really, which is which is what has happened in Pakistan and is happening in India. So, Akshay, you have a question. You want to ask a question, Akshay? You're on mute. Can Akshat hear us? I can see him. And I think I'm not audible. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so like, uh, first of all, uh, I just want to say that to Kalki Ma'am that I'm a big fan of her movie, Margareta with a Straw. And, and coming to the question, like, I just wanted to ask, like, any advice for the younger generation that you want to give to make things better as a whole? Oh gosh, I uh, I think um, no, I I don't have any advice. I I, I think you know the the advice is to not you know tell people what to do. I think the only thing we can do, especially as artists, is to put up a mirror uh, and show people who they are, what they're being. You know, um, I recently read this book on on clowns in South America and. They were using clowns as like these regulators and balances of society. So the, they weren't like you know wearing red noses and colorful clothes. They were regular people, but they would just imitate somebody who got too big for their boots or somebody who was you know abusing their power. And they would start imitating those people. And 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 so you know for example, if you thought everything you said was the gospel truth then they would just copy everything you said exactly how you said it. And then, you know, somehow made you realize how silly you sounded. And I think, I think that that's the job of artists, of comedians, of, of you know, people who, who create is to just put up a mirror in front of power, in front of um, those who are in, in power and, and, and question it and remind people, you know, that uh, this isn't necessarily the way, uh, that's, this is ne not necessarily an acceptable way of being. Yeah. Sabiha, maybe the same oh, question. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Kanki. Can I just know the name of the book you refer to? Yeah, it's called Daughters of Copper Woman. I think it's uh, the, the, the writer's called Anne Cameron. Okay, many thanks. Sabiha, do you have any advice for younger people? What, how can they, because I think there's a moment in the movie where Kalki sort of worries about a younger generation growing up segregated and not really encountering each other. And once it happens for a generation, then it's kind of late. So are there things that, you know, young people can do now um, that can offer a form of resistance? Well, I think that um, it's not just for young or old, you know, because we're all in the same boat right now. We're all fighting uh, for what we believe in and we're fighting for a direction um, that will give our country and our country people a better, a more open future. So I think that we, you know, I alone can't change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters and cause a ripple. And I think that's what we all have to keep doing, even if we do it individually or however, but we've got to keep doing that, young or old, whoever, wherever. Great question, great answer actually. The world can like just cause a ripple, and that's all we can hope to do. And enough ripples, you know, makes a wave, hopefully. Vidushi, Vidushi has a great question about the documentary. Vidushi, Vidushi. Uh, hello. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes. Sorry, so I, I logged in using my sister's email. So yeah, so my Whoa. name is Bhutan. Yeah. 
Alright. So to so say, yeah, uh, I had like a I I've been following the production of the film for like a while now, and I read like in one of the older interviews, I think. uh that uh, a lot of the parts of the film were actually uh, shot impromptu and you know there wasn't a lot of uh plot that you were following as such and then uh i remember both of you i mean i think it was sabiha's interview that she said that there were some parts that you couldn't shoot because you know you couldn't get some requisite permissions and then you had to like improvise a lot as you went through the movie and i was just wondering if there was any part that you wanted to be on the film and that didn't make it in the final cut both that goes both for you and uh, kalki if there's anything that uh, you guys thought that didn't come through in the film that you actually wanted to um, well i would have loved to uh, visit south, uh, you know south india because it is so different uh, bengal uh, i would have liked to have traveled more in india to get really a sense of the well you can't get a sense of the whole country but more or less at least you know not just stay within northern india that was not the plan but it was so tough uh, to get visas to get things organized that we really had to be practical and decide uh, whether we are making the film or not you know it had to come to that actually and um, and so we decided okay that we'll just push through with what we can get and uh, try and see if we do actually get a whole story together and i think more or less we did because the job of the film was not to show that india has so many differing views but more to show that india is now headed in this direction whether the people of the south will accept that direction or whether the bengalis will accept it or the maharashtra that was not really the question but what is the direction that the country is being forced to take or not forced mm. to take sorry uh not at all forced to take because it's the you know it, you mean the the elections have shown that mr modi has a very large majority and you know he's backed by a tremendous support so right so so it was the change of the direction of the country which was what was intriguing for me and i think for for kalki and he wanted to explore that rather than then try to see what is opinion in south what is the opinion in bengal what is opinion here and there yeah all right um also uh i just like i'll take a small moment and i want to thank kalki uh, so actually um i think about a year ago uh, somebody got this news through to you that i wrote your wikipedia and uh, that ah. yeah so so <laughs> yes. so you were, Yeah, so you were really sweet, and uh, I mean, like it was. You sent me a video message, and I and I'm really thankful because that was the nicest thing that you could have done. And then um, you sent me a follow request on Instagram, and yeah, so I also wrote the film's Wikipedia. So for Azmaish, as soon as it went into production, so <laughs> I've been following the work, and I just really uh, this was a really nice opportunity to actually be able to talk to you guys. And yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for all the research you've done. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that that's the big thing about us AMAs is to give you guys an opportunity to talk to the people that you know you've admired and followed for so long. So I'm going to give the last question to our trainee Nivedita, who's been waiting very patiently to ask her question. Nivedita, ask your question. Okay. Hello. Hi, Kalki. Hi, Sabia. My question is for Kalki this time. So, Kalki, I've admired and followed you both on and off screen uh, recently some time back i just saw the small reel about a reporter telling you ki ma'am aapka strap dikh raha hai and then you said seriously dikh raha hai first i was thinking that you're going to hide but then it was like a really good thing like you said dikh raha dikh raha it was nothing like you said it doesn't matter that that was a very small thing but it felt really empowering to someone Who's being told by all the men in her life, and even on television, what to wear, what not to wear. So this was just a thank you kind of thing, a very small thing. Uh, the main thing I really wanted to ask was, uh, you've done very very diverse roles over the year. I saw waiting, I saw ये जवानी है जवानी, Z N M D, and even Margarita with the straw. Is there something that you really really want to do in the future? Like maybe you see the need for it. because you've written scripts as well right uh, i was reading about it so is there something that you really wish to portray or you see a space for it 
Thank you. Oh gosh, um, so many things. I, I, from a personal point of view, I, I would really like to, to uh, somehow tell the story of my family's journey um, from my grandparents who were in France to my parents who moved to India and then never left. And then, um, and then you know, my, my generation, what we're going through. So I feel like so, you know, from, it was from, it would really span from World War II, before World War II to, to now, where, you know, we're, we're seeing, again, threats of world war coming back. So I, I have this, this very uh, like ambitious idea in my head of making, making this, this journey through, through, through about a century and, and the kind of things that we've all gone through. And actually from the perspective of the women, from my grandmother to my mother to, to me, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever get around to it, but that's there. And uh, other than that, honestly, I want to do a rom-com where I don't like kill the guy in the end <laughs> it'll be nice if not a movie maybe a book about your experiences or your family that yes. would be like something i'd really really like to read thank you thank you for the question Karthi. so do you have what have you thought about your next project or you know is that is that too soon <laughs> um yeah, no, I've been working on a couple of things. I'm also working on, a, I mean, I tend to work on fiction and documentary almost at the same time, developing things parallel. So I'm working on a series um, as well as a long documentary. And um, I can't really say very much about it, except um, the series is a sort of multicultural, will be shot in different countries. Oh. It's pretty women-centric. And, um, and I just shot a documentary in Sri Lanka, which is a very interesting documentary and I can talk about it. It's about um, mm. three women tuk-tuk drivers from different parts of Sri Lanka and oh, wow. uh, how they make a living. And they're all abandoned by their husbands uh, mm. for one reason or the other. And um, they uh, have children and you know they're straddling like all kinds of different responsibilities. And they've also learned to drive a tuk-tuk in a very muscular industry. So they're mm -hmm. constantly being teased by men as why do you have to come here and why do you, you know, come and take over our work and so on. And yet they march on and, you know, they somehow enjoy this idea of being tuk-tuk drivers. But what is interesting also is that women really trust their children with, with these women drivers. So they book them to pick up their kids from school, drop them to school, and also women go shopping with them. And so there's a kind of safety there. Mm -hmm. so we just explored those worlds and talked to them and also saw very vulnerable aspects of their lives and the choices they have to make. That was That's fascinating. That's wonderful. I read something recently about how Sri Lankan women are embracing surfing as a way of emancipation, you know? So apparently they've taken up surfing in a big way, which is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right, yes. Well, and that's I, it. Sorry. Sorry, I, want, I wanted to do a film about Sri Lankan women surfing, but that was not what went through uh, with oh, my, okay. my financiers and what went through was the chip <laughs> drivers. Uh, yeah, it's so wonderful. So I just have one last question because it's been in the chat box like multiple times. And I know my daughter wants to know, Kalki, when is Made in Heaven 2 coming out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me. I, I, want the no, I want the answer to that question. Um, I have my last day of shoot next week. So okay. I guess, you know, it's going to take another six months or so because, you know, post-production and all of that but hopefully hopefully for the year end you guys will see it the funny thing is that my daughter has taken such a deep dislike to poor jim sarab's character she just loathes him she's 14 years old she oh, loathes oh. Her passion and she says i hope he's not coming back i hope he's not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> about what's gonna happen yeah so, 
So no, but she loves she loves the series. Um, Unfortunately, I'm very entangled with his character, so yes, very yes. much there. <laughs> what does she see in him <laughs> like I do <laughs> so um, thank you so much it is so wonderful that you could make the time to talk to us and talk to everyone on here and thank you everybody for all your wonderful questions um, you are the guys who make our events amazing um, and interesting and thank you again for making time um, and have a wonderful week <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take so care, much. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice. Bye. 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 Bye.